Amen. Why don't we stand all across this place? Amen. Exodus chapter 3, verse 4. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside, turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And I wonder tonight if there's maybe not a young man, maybe a young woman. Maybe you feel like you're on the backside of the desert tonight. Maybe you're feeling good tonight. But you're in this place. Maybe there's a hunger, a desperation. There's a desire to know God. And you're here on a Thursday night, June 23rd, the year 2022. But I wonder what would happen for the next few moments if we had lay aside our phones, lay aside the distractions, bring into captivity every thought. And, and, and just like Moses in the desert, he turned aside. He stopped what he was doing. He was in a place of desperation and a place of isolation, but he stopped right there. And God saw and turned aside. I wonder what would happen tonight if collectively with one mind and with one accord, we got plenty going on after service. I mean, there's people that got their phones. There's text messages going on. There's a lot of distractions right now. But I wonder what would happen for the next few moments if we'd stop everything we were doing and just turn aside for a few moments. The service is going to go on. The preaching is going to happen. But for the next few moments, we're going to say, God, there's nothing more important in my life right now, God, than you moving, than you having your way, God. God, I've been distracted. God, I've been doing my own thing. God, I feel desperate tonight. But God, I'm hungry for a move of the Holy Ghost in my life. God, I need chains broken. Come on with your voices lifted with one mind and with one accord. God, we worship you. God, we praise you. God, we magnify you. God, let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable tonight. God, we lift you up. You're high and lifted up in this place. We magnify your name, King of kings and Lord of lords. You're worthy. Come on. We can do better than that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we love you. God, we love you. God, we love you. God, with everything that's inside of me, you mean more to me than anything else. God, more than this world, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, I need some people that came to lift Jesus higher and put the devil under your feet. Come on, somebody lift up the name of Jesus in this place. Somebody lift up Jesus up.
Turn to your seats. Amen. How many of you are excited to be at Double Portion 2022? Amen. We do have a few announcements. If you are enjoying what is going on at Double Portion, the experience, you can take it anywhere you go. Double Portion Podcast can be found on any and all major podcast platforms. It's also on YouTube, and there is a new episode dropped weekly. So if you want to tune into that, that's where you can find it. Also, on your way out the door tonight, there is Double Portion merch for sale. You can get it. Hey, man. You can get it. I would have worn my hoodie, but I didn't want to get set down. So I put a suit on tonight. <laughs> but there is hoodies and hats. The hats are 25. The hoodies are 35. You can find them at the table directly exiting the doors after service. Also, following the service this evening, after God's through with whatever he wants to do for the remainder of the service, every single one of you are invited to the Donna Cordova Center. The address is 1121 Beaumont Avenue. Once again, every single person here is invited to the Donna Cordova Center for a time of food and fellowship following the service. You may be seated. Y'all don't have to stand up the whole time. Amen. That's immediately following this service. Now everybody look at your neighbor and say, Friday morning. Come on, some of y'all didn't do it. Look at your other neighbor and say, Friday morning. At 9 a.m. right here in the building, in the sanctuary, we will be having a time of devotion with Reverend and Pastor Greg Charles from Garden City. You do not want to miss this. Once again, that is right here at 9 a.m. And if you get here early, there will be breakfast provided in, (coughs) in the hospitality room. Mike Covers trying to kill me. Breakfast will be provided in the hospitality room. So come a little bit early. There will be a waffle bar if you get here early. Following the service tomorrow morning, we will be headed again to the Donna Cordova Center for more fun and fellowship. Once again, that's 1121 Beaumont Avenue. And this will be the official kicking off of... Sneaker days, so don't wear them to service, but bring them for after service. Bring your best kicks, and you might ask, what is sneaker day? The person that is wearing the best sneakers will be receiving a gift. So make sure you polish them up tonight. Make sure you get them spick and span looking good, and wear them tomorrow after the service at the gymnasium. There will be a giveaway for the best kicks. Also... Look at somebody next to you and say, the best drip. The best drip. drip. Whoever has the best drip will also be receiving a prize. And if you don't know what that is, you will have to find somebody and ask them, what is the best drip? It's okay. I had to ask somebody in the choir yesterday, which made me feel a little bit old, but that's okay. So find somebody and ask them, a young person, what is the best drip? So tomorrow, after the service, there will be a gift for the best sneakers, and there will be a gift for the best drip. Then, tomorrow night, one more time, we will gather in this sanctuary, and we will kick off the grand finale night of double portion, the calling in the prayer room. What better place to find your calling than in the prayer room? 
Reverend Claiborne will be preaching that. You don't want to miss it. But let's all of the announcements out of the way. Why don't we stand up again? There's a lot of people from a lot of churches gathered around. So we're going to take the next few minutes while the choir sings this song. Why don't you get out where you're sitting? Why don't you mingle around, shake a few hands, meet a few new people, and let them know you're happy to see them in the house of the Lord tonight.
Lord, we worship you. Hallelujah. Oh, turn to your neighbor and tell him he's a great God. Hallelujah. Turn to your another neighbor and tell him he's a great God. Praise the Lord. Isn't God good? Amen. Amen. I am so glad to be in the house of the Lord with friends. Amen. I look upon this congregation and I see people that have had miracle upon miracle. Amen. You may be seated. Second Corinthians 9 and 7 says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity. So there's a balance somewhere in there. Not grudgingly or of necessity. But there is a different aspect of giving that God loves. And that is that God loveth a cheerful giver. Amen. Can I get a witness that God has blessed somebody when they cheerfully gave unto him? It's contagious. Amen. We've been wanting to schedule a vacation and looking at these airfares, it's discouraging, isn't it? Yeah. The airfares have caught up with the gas and the gas keeps on rising and we get caught up in the inflation, yet we haven't inflated our offerings to keep up, have we? And, and we uh, are stuck in a mode of giving in a way that we did 20 years ago or 50 years ago. Maybe some of you got in church 70 years ago or 50 years ago, and you've been giving unto the Lord at a new convert level from your prior, from your past. And, and I just want to say that I honor you. I thank you for whoever has been in the church for many, many years. I'm thankful that I've been in the church since I was 17 years old. And I see youth here. You have so much ahead of you. But we want to inflate our offering. We want to do something that helps the ministry when there's a time of pain for ministry to fly at a higher rate than ever before. I want to give unto the Lord tonight in a way that honors him. I feel that. And I want us to just ask the Lord to put upon our hearts something that is not just what we predetermined, but something that is of faith and do it cheerfully. Mighty God, we ask that you would help us tonight to give as cheerful givers, not out of necessity or of pressure, and, and not grudgingly out of duty. But God, I pray that we do it out of joyful duty. Thank you, Lord, that we can give unto the cause of Christ. I pray that your mighty hand would increase and bless this offering. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Come to pass. I believe you're moving, and you're not finished yet. Anybody believe that tonight? Come on, help me. 
help us to get to heaven.
believe that in this house I believe, I believe it. You it, is done. it is done said you said it Lord said I believe it I believe it my family will be saved We lift our hands to, to praise him, to worship him right now. Everybody across this house. Oh, let's praise him. Come on now. The Lord is worthy. Woo, there's an undercurrent of the Holy Ghost here. they were singing and there's such a powerful anointing and the scripture came to me because I, I look out among Americans today and even with the hardships rising prices it was difficult for many of you to get here this year hotel costs are ridiculous uh, gas prices are ridiculous and all of that and we could bemoan that fact but here you are you came because you love Jesus and you love your young people and there are many young people here that have never felt the pressure of where your next car payment and house payment is coming from Never felt the pressure of being the man of the house and wondering, God, how do I provide for my children? 
And so you're here tonight and you're enjoying incredible talent. You're enjoying powerful anointing. You're enjoying people that have worked hard for weeks to make this happen. And the scripture came to me in the book of Revelations where the Lord said of the church at Laodicea, they were rich and increased with goods. And there may be young people here tonight thinking, well, I don't know what I need. I'll tell you what you need. You need a double portion of his anointing tonight. You don't know what you're facing in the future, but he does. And he's already got provision laid out for you. It's already there. He's got handfuls on purpose. They're already laid out. If you'll tap into the Holy Ghost tonight, young man. If you'll tap into the Holy Ghost tonight, young lady. God's already went ahead of you. Somebody ought to praise him right now. Come on, you ought to praise him like you're really in love with him. You ought to praise him like you're really in love with him. Praise God. Praise God. I want to take just a few minutes, and I want to recognize all of the churches that are here. I see Pastor Charles from Ulysses, Kansas, uh, Garden City, Kansas, excuse me, not too far from Ulysses. Brother Charles from Garden City, Kansas, who will be speaking to us tomorrow. And I'm going to tell you something. You don't want to miss this. This man lives what he preaches. And that's what makes it so powerful. And we're so honored to have them in the church that is from Garden City and Ulysses. We have folks here from Ulysses, the church. I am so excited about what God is doing in Ulysses, Kansas. <laughs> Praise God. So glad that they are with us. And all the way from Cheyenne, Wyoming, Brother Keith, we're so delighted that you're with us tonight. God bless you, sir. Brother Hageman and your church, we're so honored that you're here. Our sister church in Greeley, Colorado, we're just so delighted that they are with us. And uh, Sister Salas from Pratt, Brother Joe wasn't able to make it. Brother Joe Salas, Pastor Salas. But we're delighted all the way from Pratt, Kansas. They're with us. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, uh, and from Pueblo. <laughs> and of course, Pastor Carricker and these wonderful young people from Hutchinson, Kansas, we're delighted that you are with us. God bless you. And I just, I want to take a little bit of time and so tell you thank you. I know the sacrifice that it is for you to make this journey. It does not go unnoticed by us. And we thank you so much. I feel like God's going to do something special in this house tonight. How many of you feel like God is going to do something? Can you give God another high praise tonight? Let's worship him. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> when we began Double Portion, um, many of us got together, and Brother Mitchell, Brother, J or Brother Elder, and myself, and, and uh, we, we didn't really want a conference that was necessarily what everybody else had just for the sake of being what everybody else had. But I felt in my spirit and the others as well that there were young people in this area that were going to change the course of history in this area, this eastern Colorado, now northern Colorado, and uh, western Kansas region. That's the legacy of, of the elder family and this church and reaches on beyond all of that and we wanted that to carry on and so it wasn't really about being cool or being hip I mean it's I mean it's alright to be all that stuff I'm not saying it's not but it was more that God was putting something in us that there are young people 
that have the capability of going to a city and starting church like the greats that we've heard about, C.P. Kilgore. That didn't die with that generation. But there's a double portion that God is putting on this generation. And so when we pray and when we seek the face of God, we consider that in our speakers. And this year, I prayed, we prayed, talked with Bishop, and this name kept reoccurring in my spirit. A great man of God that I've watched from a distance, and God has afforded us the opportunity to become closer throughout the years. And I felt so strongly that God was sending Brother Ryder to this conference for this hour because there is something that God is going to infuse into this place tonight. I believe that with all of my heart. Young people, this is the year of the calling. There's missionaries in this place. There's evangelists in this place. There's pastors. There's young ladies that the anointing of Edwin Elder is in this place. And you can pray and teach Bible studies and change cities forever. I believe that with all of my heart. And so as this man of God comes to preach to us tonight, I wonder if there would be an absolute openness. God, whatever you have, whatever you have, I want all of it. I don't want a portion. I don't want half. I want a double portion of it. I want everything and more, God, in the name of Jesus. Come and preach to us, Brother Ryder. Why don't we lift our hands to him? He's made himself obvious in this place. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, if you know him, talk to him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What an honor to be in his presence tonight. Amen. And what an honor to be here with all of you. It is a distinct privilege to step to this pulpit of a church that I have long heard of, the elder family and Pueblo, Colorado, has been on the radar of everyone that I have ever looked to or called upon for leadership in my life. And it is a privilege to step foot into this building with all of you here, privilege to have my wife and boys with me. God bless you for all the extended energy coming. And... Um, If you think it's easier for me to travel by myself, you can guarantee it's easier for them for me to travel by myself. And so they really made the double effort, and I wouldn't want to do life any other way than with them. Bishop and Sister Elder, bless you. Thank you for your confidence. I appreciate the opportunity, Brother Jeff and um, and Elder and Sister, wherever she went. Elder, bless you. And uh, I told her earlier, I said, it's good to have a little southern feeling here in the house And no, we're we're not Texan, but we claim it anyhow. And Brother Mitchell, Elder, and your wife, God bless you. To all the ministry here, I've been able to shake a number of hands, meet and know a lot of names, and I honor you. Um, I'm sorry I missed last night. Where is he at? There he is, Brother Azar. I'm sorry. We got to party for your birthday, but I didn't get to party with you last night. I heard it was outstanding. Good to see you. Glad to meet Brother and Sister Claiborne. Looking forward to tomorrow night and what the Lord is going to do. I feel like the Lord has impressed me with a message to give to this particular group. I had no idea uh, who would be here, how it was set up. I, I, I felt an unction come upon the invitation and past that the details didn't matter to me. Any longer, and so if you'll help me tonight, the Holy Ghost has made himself obvious in this place, has he not? And so we know he's here, and we know it's his will to touch us and to change us. And so I want to preach to you tonight with that help out of 1 Samuel chapter 16, 
1 Samuel chapter 16, a very, very familiar portion of Scripture. We'll begin reading in verse number 10. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 10. The word of the Lord says to us, Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, call for him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with a, of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. I wish we could lift our hands once again before you're seated this evening. And let's ask the Lord to impart the word, not just a word, but the word. I believe he's going to talk to a young person in this building. I believe he's going to elevate the calling that's already presided over you. But he's going to reconnect you with that fervor. Oh, Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. You can be seated. It's admittedly a curious thing to me in this atmosphere and in the particular atmosphere of the day. It's been mentioned a couple of times. But we live in a fast-paced social media instant gratification everyone's highlight reels in our face all the time kind of world. And it's interesting to say the least. I won't belabor much of an introduction for I feel that the Lord has somewhat to say to us this evening. So let me dive in just a little bit here. Who it was that Samuel's eyes first fell on and who it was who was first prompted to walk and pass before the prophet. Eliab would later attempt to kind of veil his lack of confidence as he would prod David, who heard the cries of a Goliath across the valley. And instead of helping him or saying, no, I'm the eldest, I should go, he kind of, he kind of in a cowardice way, he ribbed and prodded David about what he was trying to do. He he, by nature of what seems to be the record of his, um, his character, wouldn't have been the one that, that Samuel would have first picked out, but he was. He was the firstborn, and he was the first mentioned in, in, in the, the record of Samuel walking in to Jesse's house, then Abinadab, and then Shema, the, the, the two, uh, the second, rather, and the third born of Jesse. Very little detail about either of these names, simply that they were at the battle that day with Goliath and the Philistines, but not very vocal on any account. But, but why them, Brother Elder? I understand some of the culture. I, I understand some of, of, of the, the, the right of firstborn and, and, and then the one who would follow after that. I, I get that, but, but maybe there's a little beyond it when we watch as Samuel gets a tap on the shoulder by the Lord and he says, hey, you're not about to pick a king for my people who's going to be king because of what the outside looks like. I'm not fixing to draw a king to lead my people and to be the one who's going to do what he's going to do so that his son can do what he couldn't do. I'm not picking that based off of a highlight reel. I'm not picking that based off of a Photoshop picture where everybody sees what's not really there and misses what is really there. Hallelujah. 
there's always a front and a center. There's always the limelight, the ones that seem to have the natural and automatic press toward the center of the stage. I'm not here to grind an axe nor make bones about it. I'm not here to take a stand against those, but really the truth is I'm about to preach about a young man and a young woman who God is trying to elevate to their full capacity of ministry. But, but the reality is there, there's, there's always that one it's always those that somehow get passed before the eyes of the prophet first. Can I say it this way? That the foundation of God's dealings with mankind from the very genesis of all of this talk about what I'm preaching here on a Thursday night. Abraham and his family. There is so much written, so much repeated, so much canonized, and so much preached about Abram and Sarai. Their journey and their promises and all of the nuances therein. The exploits as Abraham saves Lot and brings back all that Sodom had lost and a tithing till Melchizedek. So many foundational pieces of an apostolic church that are built on these things. The patriarch from whom the founding father of Israel would come and by the time we get to the New Testament they're still talking about Father Abraham. From the Sunday school room to the Pharisee hall they're talking about Father Abraham. Everything is about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The stories abound. The mountain, the fire, the ram in the thicket, the coat of many colors given to Joseph, the salvation of Israel through the blessing of the next generation. You know these stories, gentlemen, and, and it's all about Abraham. Everyone's focus is on Abraham, and rightly so. He's front and center of every news article. He's praised vocally and publicly. But I want to tell you something on a Thursday night. Young people, I don't know you, and you don't know me, but I've come to tell you something that is not profound, but it's whatever the Lord is wanting to tell us here on a Thursday night at Double Portion. Do not forget what I'm about to tell you. God always has somebody hanging back in obscurity that you cannot see save maybe out of the peripheral vision of your eye there are young people under the sound of my voice that socially financially in the way of favor you don't seem to be and you don't feel like you're poised for great things or deep ministry or earth shaking warfare but I'm on a mission by the Holy Ghost to tell you that he is going to reach into your spirit and he is going to change your thinking at this youth conference. It doesn't matter what household you grew up in. It doesn't matter what bus route brought you to the house of God or what dark, hazy, obscure background you seem to have been born in. God's desire to anoint you. God's desire to elevate you. God's desire to use you is prevalent here in this place. So let me preach for a few moments about anointed in obscurity. Look at your neighbor and say, anointed. I'm anointed. I may be obscure. I may not be on your radar. Nobody in this building may know my first name. Brother Elder may never call me. I may not be the first one they lay hands on. I may not have a calendar full of Bible studies or conferences yet. I may be resting in a state of obscurity, but I am none the less anointed. I'm going to preach this into your spirit over the next 25 minutes. Praise God. Job was a picture of what I'm talking about. Job was a picture along with men like Gideon and like the David we read about. He was on the periphery. He was not on the main page. All eyes were on the patriarch. All eyes were on Abraham. All eyes were on Genesis 12. All eyes were on Isaac and what was going to happen between him and Ishmael. All eyes 
or on that lineage, and rightfully so. I get it. I understand. But, but I, I want to remind you that while Job was not even a blip on the radar in, in anyone's records in that day, God was having conversations with Satan about Job. And while he wasn't, he wasn't canonized in the book of Genesis, God was having conversations with Satan. Both Job and Abraham, by the writing of many commentators in my, my personal study as far or whatever that means, they, they were both of a nomadic culture, by and large con, considered to be contemporaries. But let me tell you, you can read Hebrews 11 as many times as you want it, in as many languages as you want it, in as many translations as you want to read it in. And you read about Abraham, and you read about Isaac, and you read about Sarah, and you read about their family, but you never find the word Job mentioned in the book and chapter of faith. But God said this, have you considered Job? Anybody know the answer? No. No, no. What, Job? Job who? Job who? Send me a link to his YouTube videos. Oh, sorry, Sister Elder, he ain't got one. Hey, can you tag me on something he preached? No, sorry, he ain't got No, No, I, in all of your canvassing of the world, um, you've not met this man. He's been on the backside of nowhere. And Lucifer, I know you haven't heard of him. I know you haven't seen his reels on IG. In all of your searching to and fro, I'm sure you've not heard him preach. I'm sure you've not heard her sing because I have hidden him in obscurity. But let me tell you a little bit about Job. There ain't nobody like him on the face of this earth. And while you're not coming to me about him, I'm trusting Job enough that I'll come. Oh, I feel my helper in the building. That I'll come to you about him. I'm telling you there's anointing that's hidden by the wayside under the sound of my voice. I wish you'd raise your hands to heaven right now. Young people, listen to me preach. While Abraham's been digging wells and building altars and everybody's reposting his exploits on social media, Job's been in prayer. Job's been in consecration. Job's been sacrificing continually to cover his kids in case they ignorantly step out of line. Listen to me, young evangelist, who's just breaking out full time, but you're not yet all of the time. While Isaac and Ishmael's uh, deal was the talk of the town, Job's children have been taken from him in a tragic storm. Listen to me, single young lady who feels like you're running out of time while Jacob and Esau are bickering about beans and, and, and competing for birthright blessings. Sickness has taken his family, his livestock, his goods, his entire life, and now Job sits on a heap of shards of broken yesterdays and he weeps. What are you saying preacher? I'm saying it might seem to you like everybody else's focus is somewhere else. Everybody else's focus is on Abraham. Everybody else's focus is on that guy or that woman or that church or that pastor or that ministry. But God's creating a story that's going to impact the world for all of time. For no matter how low the modern day church's life gets there's always Job and his patience and prevailing hallelujah don't get distracted by your obscurity. Something that's obscure cannot be seen very well. It's shadowy. It's hazy. It's there, but, it, but the outlines aren't sharp because it doesn't have the light and the clarity that it's needed. I'm telling you, don't give up on your young God-given dreams. That may seem to be a little bit hazy. They're so far in my past. A dream I had at 12 or 13, and now at 19, I'm struggling to live for God. Don't give up on your young, God-given dream. It may be hazy from where you're sitting. You may not be able to see the sharp edges of the ministry that was prophesied to you from where you're sitting. 
But that obscurity that you're living in, and you're blinking your eyes trying to see through the fog, that's where God falls. That's where God anoints. That's where God makes the difference. I know it feels a little odd. I know what I'm preaching is hard to sink in. It doesn't have a real fast saturation point to it. But I'm just here to tell you, it's all fun and games to make fun of the 700 who can kill about anything from any distance. But they're a little odd. They think a little different. They act a little different. Their coordination's a little different. They're all Benjaminites, uh, and they're all left-handed. Uh, but there will be a day in your city uh, where a fat thing uh, of the enemy uh, will be killed uh, by an obscure, uh, out-of-the-way, uh, unique, uh, left-handed uh, Benjamite. Uh, I'm preaching there's anointing uh, in obscurity. Uh, there's anointing uh, where you are. Uh, there's anointing uh, in your chaos. Most of all, my heroes were born spiritually, if not literally, in obscurity. Bishop, I just got the opportunity a little bit ago to spend a good time with my child, one of my childhood heroes. He was born in a little bitty town whose name you would not recognize in the Midwest. And he was born to a church that had an outhouse. No running water. One day at a funeral, they come to get a lady and they opened the front door of the church and said to the back one that hadn't been open for 50 years. And the entire door frame facing fell off into the street. He said, I remember thinking, my God, how are we ever going to have revival? And he, if I called his name, you'd know it. You'd know his voice. You'd be able to quote his messages. If I called his name, you'd know him. He has graced more pulpits in this universe or in this globe than you and I will probably ever stand at. I'm telling you, just because it was birthed in obscurity. Bishop's your pastor. Bishop Wilson, is that you? you you're, 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 a great, you're a great pastor. You know the story. Y'all know the story. I won't be laboring. He was born spiritually in a revival where when the preacher asked about it later, was asked about it later, here was the commentary on the revival. Ah, yeah, I remember it. Seemed like it was a struggle. I mean, not much good came out of it. But a man named Nathaniel Wilson spoke in tongues for the very first time. Oh, I'm telling you, there is anointing to be born in obscurity. In Cleburne, Texas, about, about 80 years ago, there was a revival book that could be found where they would put the dates of the revivals, the name of the preacher, the guest ministry that came and at the bottom would be the summation of that revival report and in that little book if you could find it today it would have these words written I've heard him say it a hundred thousand times there was just one little boy that received the Holy Ghost Marvin Dale Treese who turned this world and my family upside down there is anointing in your obscurity. You may be the only one in your youth group, but that obscurity, that haziness, that awkwardness may be elevated to be the voice that saves young people from thousands of miles. Oh, why don't you reach out and touch it if you feel what I'm preaching. I believe some of you can't know what I'm preaching, but you can feel what I'm preaching. Why don't you reach your hands out? Come on, lean into what you feel right now. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, pray. There's a group of people in West Monroe gathering an hour ago to start praying for this preacher. I appreciate you gathering and watching. You've heard much of this. Why don't you help me pray? I believe we're fixing to take the turn on a Thursday night at Double Portion. I believe somebody's fixing to walk in a depth and in a richness of anointing that you've only dreamed of, you've only heard of, you've only thought of. Oh, 
Oh, Jesus. Be seated if you dare. Samuel takes the horn of oil. He takes the horn of oil. He makes his way to Jesse's house. God has spoken. He has found himself a new king. And now it's up to the man of God to go put his eyes on what God already sees. Because man sees it a lot later than God sees it. And man starts working towards it a lot later than God starts working toward it. So with a deal of secrecy, he makes his way to Jesse's house. And supposedly, supposedly, all of the sons of Jesse are present. And here in a moment, the prophet standing there, who's been dedicated solidly to God since a young boy, here the prophet standing there is about to have all the sons. Look at you and say, all the sons. All the sons of Jesse. I mean, that's the point, right? That's what, we're, that's, what we're, that's what we're headed to, right? That's what we're going toward, correct? I mean, that's what, that's what we're doing. I, I know he's the son of Jesse, so throw all the sons of Jesse out in front of me. Sister Elder, it wasn't all the sons of Jesse. That was the plan, though. All the sons of Jesse are going to be here. God's going to move. I'm going to use this horn of all I've got draped around my neck. And, and man, it's going to happen. Israel's going to be saved. And then he walks in the room. And he looks at what's front and center. I hope I disclaimed myself enough. I'm not preaching against that. And he looks at Eliab. And I don't know what Eliab looked like. But he must have looked pretty good. Because he turned the eye of the prophet. Yeah. And he, he says, that word is used equally in the Bible for speaking out loud or speaking in one's heart. So I'm not assuming that he said it out loud and then God corrected him verbally out loud. I'm assuming he said it in his heart. And God responded, don't look on the outside, bud. Don't look on the countenance. Okay. Now, I know the rules. <laughs> And Jesse's like, oh, okay, well, if it's not him, then surely it's Abinadab. And into the limelight he went. Well, if it's not him, then surely it's Shammah. Well, okay. You were the four rascals come out here. I don't know who they were. They didn't even get a name on this thing. He puts them in front of him. No, it's not Timmy. Seven, seven sons come back out. And from careful, careful, Samuel. Because what looks to be the obvious choice in God's eyes pales in comparison to what everyone else wants to keep hidden. Once the prophet understands, he taps into what God's doing. Watch the difference of his perception of David and of Jesse's perception of David. The difference in the prophet's perception of David and 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 the carnal father's perception of David. Jesse doesn't even attempt. Well, maybe he didn't think of him or maybe he couldn't spare him. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll buy that for just a moment, but but what about the second time the seven sons come in front? You mean to tell me nowhere up and nowhere upstairs did Jesse go, ooh. I got one boy out. I wonder what's going on. Nowhere was there a thought or a question or a hesitation about what was going on. No. Here's the real deal. Jesse thought David was better left in obscurity. Jesse didn't want to bring David in the room. Jesse didn't want to take David off the hill. Jesse didn't want to send a messenger to David. He's out on the brow of the hill tending the sheep. Let's just leave well enough alone. And finally, the man of God says, do you have any others? Jesse doesn't even want to present David. What Jesse wants to hide in obscurity. What Jesse wants to hide in obscurity. What Jesse wants to hide in obscurity. God has sent the prophet to anoint. You have judged yourself. You have judged your neighbor. You have judged your son. You have judged your daughter based off of their obscurity. But God's here to anoint. 
what's been hiding on the backside of the hill for too long at this point. <laughs> you have to understand something. Samuel is thought to have written at least the first, maybe 50 or 60 percent of the book of First Samuel. So you're not just getting a prophet versus a daddy's perception. You're getting an author. All of a sudden, watch the emotions roll back over Samuel when he puts his eyes on what God has already anointed. Jesse says, forget about it. Jesse said, no, 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 nobody else worth calling. But he says, no, go get them. And we ain't moving from this position until you do. Can I tell you some things will forever be in a, a state of limbo until you let God anoint you in your obscurity. He steps in the room, and I can imagine what the heartbeat of that old man of God did. I'm almost done. I'm not going to be very long, if for no other reason but the altitude. This is a, Samuel has a gush of emotion. He steps in the room, and all of a sudden, the experience of Samuel starts taking over the pen. And he says, now, now listen, he came in. Now, oh, listen to me, honey. Oh, this boy, he was red-faced. This boy had a good look to him. He was flat good looking. And when he walked in the room, the voice that I heard laying on that bed dozens of years ago spoke to me and said, go and anoint him that's the one that's the one that's the one it looks entirely different in the spirit of prophecy than it does to your fleshly eyes. All you can see is that you're a nobody on the backside of nowhere. But God sent a man on a Thursday night to Pueblo, Colorado to shake you and wake you up. There's a nighting in your obscurity. Can I tell you, the prophet that's laid hands on you, he isn't always, as the musicians, please come. He's not always going to say everything he's thinking. He's not always going to say everything he's feeling because you might not be able to handle everything he's thinking and everything he's feeling. Can I tell you, most of the time, the man of God's just going to do what he was told to do, and then he's going to head back home. He's just going to show up and preach on a midweek service, and he's going to say something that's still reverberate in your ears when you lay your head down on the pillow and say man I wish I could tell you oh, no 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 you don't need to talk to him if you can't believe what he preached then you'll never believe what he tells you in private if you don't believe when the impartation comes over this pulpit then you'll never believe it over breakfast and coffee you got to get your obscurity out of your crawl and let God use what he desires to anoint. Oh, Jesus. No, the old prophet, he just pours the oil on top of David. And then he goes home and he, he returned after the spirit settled he returned to Rama which was his house it's where he lived but it was also where he died and nine chapters later nine chapters later they bury him almost as if he had completed his work almost like his greatest task was checked off see you'll head home after Brother Cleburne preaches Friday night. You'll get home wherever you came from with the same grind, same group, same temptations, same distractions, same obscurity. Where'd David go? Well, where did David's father draw him from to go bring food to his brothers and to check on the water? Back 
to the flock. So he goes back to the flock. And once more, it looks like obscurity. Once more, it sounds like obscurity. I hate to do this, but once more, it smells like obscurity. And sitting, sitting there on the brow of that hill, back lost. Conference was powerful. And the trip was fun. And the preaching, well, Wednesday night and Friday night was really good. And then the wind swirls. And David gets a whiff of that prophetic smell concocted by the apothecary that the men of God had poured. Saturated him. And he remembers. <laughs> he remembers. He remembers. All of a sudden it hits him. Oh my. I may be on a sheep hill. I may be back here with nobody but these, but these bleeding sheep to even talk to. The most exciting thing that might happen to me is a little mountain bear come up and try to steal a sheep. I'm in obscurity. But I'm anointed. I smell it. And that anointing's got promises. That smell has prophetic nature to it. That smell is about to do things for me. Nobody else can smell it. See, you'll go home. You'll go home. And you'll get in a church service on Sunday night. And they'll sing the same songs and do the same stuff. And the same people will look at you the same way. And the same mistakes you made will be there present. And you'll be thinking of them even though nobody else is. And, and it'll be the same old obscurity. Bishop, how, how, however, somewhere, somewhere along the middle of your pastor's message the breath of God will start stirring and you'll hear a sound and you'll smell a certain smell and, and I don't mean physically I mean spiritually and all of a sudden you'll get this different attitude I pray about you uh, I don't care if anybody else hears it I don't care if anybody else gets it I don't care if anybody else is excited I, I don't care what anybody else thinks about it I don't care if anybody else understands I don't care if they're riding the van shoulder to shoulder all the way back home with me they may not understand they may see me in my obscurity they may see me with my my halted speech they may see me in whatever makes me feel like I do how ever my obscurity does not halt my anointing you're gonna have to come to a realization young people that he's not removing you from your obscurity. Oh, I'd like to preach that everything's about to get better and everything's about to turn to gold. Can I tell you, it's likely to happen for you like it did for David. It's probably not all going to end when I give an altar call. It's probably not all going to be gold and pearls and, 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 and flyers and revivals. When Brother Claiborne's finished, you might have to go back to that place of obscurity but when you get there, you'll have a resolution. You'll have, you'll have a revelation. You'll, you'll be resolved to the fact that while he's not taking me out of my obscurity, he is. He is anointing me. He is anointing me. Oh, I don't know how to get this in your spirit tonight. He is anointing me in my obscurity. I know it's late. Singers can get ready. Uh, how did David hold on to it? Preacher, how did David hold on to it? He got baptized with it. He got saturated with it. And you're going to have to get drenched with the same thing that David got drenched with sound man media people please pull Psalm chapter 133 verse 2 I've read it in Exodus I've read it in Leviticus I've read it everywhere I can read it and I don't find nobody that gave the details of this in the Old Testament have you it talks about Moses pouring the all on air and I mean we know how gravity works but <laughs> how David know that it flowed down his beard into the I'm going to tell you, you can, 
You can write songs about things you've heard. And you can write songs about things you've been told. But there ain't no songs that come out of something like this but then what you have experienced yourself. David wasn't around, neither did he hear a detailed interpretation of what happened to Aaron the day Moses poured the anointing all over him. But when he got anointed, he experienced the drenching, the, the outpouring, the top to bottom experience of what anointing does and he penned the words it's like the precious oil that flowed ran down the beard even to the ribbon of blue of the man named Aaron I'm here to tell you if you want to last through your obscurity you're going to have to get drenched in this anointing oil and when the winds of obscurity blow and the winds of temptation blow that bring with it nothing but the smell of sheep and a lonesome hill there will be with it the prophetic reminder Oh, I need some young people to lean into the Holy Ghost right now. If you know what I'm preaching. Come on, hear me well. You cannot go home and handle the amount of anointing oil that's been poured on you with the filters and the expectations born of the obscurity that you're living in because your anointing is greater. I want you to listen to me. I know you're praying. Keep that spirit. But listen to me. Your obscurity is no match for the anointing that's here. You see, I'm nobody from nowhere. Yeah. So was M.D. Trees. So was Scott Graham. So was Brother Wilson. But they somehow got a hold of the fact but this, what I, what I have, what was just poured on me is mightier than the bleak background. I don't care if nobody, I don't care if nobody ever taught you how to sing. You're anointed. L- listen to me, young men over here. I don't care if nobody. It don't matter if nobody ever sits down with you and shows you how to take a text and read into a context and bring a one, two, three point message to it. It doesn't matter. That stuff you'll figure out. You can figure that out in books. What you really need to focus on is not the obscurity you're in. See, if you focus on the obscurity, it'll distract you. It'll distract you until you set your anointing down and start working on a name for yourself. Start working on an Instagram page that gets attention. Baby, let me tell you, uh, your obscurity is your best friend uh, because there ain't nothing but you uh, and that anointing oil uh, at 3 a.m. in your bedroom uh, and that right. Hey, I'm not looking for fanfare. I don't need you to like this preaching. I need you to come face to face with what the Holy Ghost is telling you. Nobody knows your name, but God sent a man to tell you it is your turn. It's your turn. There's enough anointing in this room. I'm telling you, you are all. Oh my God, I wish I knew who you were so I knew who I was preaching to. You're the only thing your city needs. 
You, baby, you the only thing revival in your city is waiting on. Well, I'm just nobody. I came on a bus three years ago. I talked in tongues, but but I ain't got a, let me tell you, I ain't got a single preacher in my lineage. Nobody ever sat down with me and told me how to preach a message. Nobody ever sat with me and taught me how to pray. But I'm telling you, if you let your obscurity distract you from your anointing, there are things that are in motion that will never be fulfilled. Your city, your coffee shop, your breakfast table, your high school, your friends, your neighbors. Come on. Somebody's got to teach a Bible study. Why not you? Come on. Somebody's got to be used in the gifts. Why not you? Come on. Somebody's going to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Why not you? Come on. Come on, if I could get one of you to really jump into what I'm saying. If I could get one of you to really dive into what the Holy Ghost is trying to hammer into you.
There's, there's a science behind about what I'm about to tell you. But specialists can go into a place that's as large as this building that's burnt all the way down to the ground, nothing but rubble and ashes, and they can take you to the spot where the fire started. The spot where the fire started. And right here, under the sound of my voice, I'm not trying to be cliche and I'm not trying to be cute, but I have to believe, I have to believe that there are people under the sound of my voice, I know there's three or four because God's, God's being in you every time I come by. Who are you? Not just for this revival, but right here, right here in this moment, you are the spot that's supposed to spark the sentinel that's supposed, supposed to first capture what the Holy Ghost is doing and then broadcast. I wonder without any music, without any help, without any cheerleading, I don't care if you're up here on this platform or all the way to the back of this church, if God's talking to you, I want you to open your spirit and raise your voice right now as the anointing falls. clear. Pray your way out of your obscurity. Pray your way out. Come on. Let the anointing burn all that doubt off of you. I rebuke doubt right now in Jesus name. Come on. I don't know when, but he's going to elevate you. He's going to elevate you. He's going to put you in the king's court. But not until you learn how to let the, the anointing come in the midst of your obscurity. That's it. That's it. Come on. Come on, sis. Come on, sis. Come on, honey. Come on. Let him talk through you. Come on. Let him talk through you. the spirit of prophecy is going to operate while you're the only one in your bedroom long before it operates at an altar setting. Somebody ought to get bold and begin to covet the best gifts. Come on Shake the doubt off. Shake the hesitation off. And say, God, I want it. I don't want a little. I don't even want a lot. I want a double portion of everything I can have. Come on, Samuel was barely weaned and he could hear the voice of God. I wonder how young these little boys are and I believe the voice of God will start speaking on a Thursday night. Come on. 
just like the sling wasn't a new thing, the anointing wasn't new either. David had been dancing under the anointing for a long, long, long time. Come on, Brother Jeffrey Elder. Come on. Impart that anointing to that young man. Impart the vision God's given you right now. Come on, if your pastor would be approving of it, I want you to lay your hand. Ladies, don't you get bashful. Lay your hand on the forehead right next to you and let the anointing that God is pouring into you, let it spill over, let it spill over, let it spill over. Jesse Elder, it's been too long since you've let that anointing flow through you. Come on, come on. He'll talk through you right now. I feel an operation of the Spirit hovering over you.
Come on, I wish somebody would just jump. Jump into what you feel. Come on. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and you hear the sound thereof, but you canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. That's how the Holy Ghost works. The wind is here. You better jump in while he is. Come on, don't wait. Come on, don't hesitate. Come on, don't wait.
Come on, I didn't come all the way to Colorado, and neither did you for just a little patty cake altar. I'm telling you, I've been laying hands on a few people, and God's trying to impart some gifts right now, some anointing right now, that if you really get it, and even if your obscurity doesn't change when you get home, if you'll exercise it on the backside of nowhere, if you'll exercise it and operate in it when nobody's watching, the king will call for you. Come on. You're the only hope of Goliath going down in your city. You're the only hope of methamphetamines being destroyed by spirit in your city. Oh, but who am I? You're anointed. Who am I? I don't have the last name. I don't have the 401k. I don't have the fancy car. I don't have the speech skills. No, but you got the anointing. See, you don't understand it. You can never fathom it. But God's having conversations with the principalities of your, your city. And they're worried about you coming home to Kansas. They're worried about what's going to happen on Monday. Don't let the fact that you're the only one living an apostolic lifestyle and your family stop the flow of anointing in your city.
Brother DJ's getting the Holy Ghost right now. <laughs> 